Once upon a time, upon a world far away, there lived a boy whose name was Aster. Now, Aster's mother and father had died when Aster had been very young, and ever since that time, Aster had been raised by his widowed grandmother. Now, when Aster grew to be seven years old, his grandmother gave him a small jar of seeds, and Aster was allowed to have his very own little flower garden. And by the time Aster was ten years old, his flower garden was the biggest and most beautiful flower garden in the entire county. Anytime anyone got married, they went to Aster to get flowers for the wedding, and anytime anyone died, their families went to Aster to get flowers for the funeral. One summer, a neighbor of Aster's had two daughters who were about to be married on the same day, and Aster traded nearly all the flowers in his entire garden in exchange for a colt which was about to be born from his neighbor's mare, and when the horse was born, the boy and the horse grew taller together, and one was seldom seen without the other. But when Aster grew to be 13 years old, there was a massive earthquake, and although their cottage suffered little damage, Aster's flower gardens were destroyed, and worse yet, their old barn had collapsed, and his horse had been killed. In spite of his tears, Aster somehow managed to bury the horse, and there had not even been enough flowers left over to cover the grave, and they soon found that the damage in the nearby town had been even worse. Men had brought a wagon to their farm to collect flowers for the funerals. Dozens of people had been killed, and all of their graves were in need of flowers, but there were no flowers left. Aster rode with the men into the town, and when he saw how little of the town was left, he was astonished. Most of the houses had fallen down, and even the cathedral had collapsed, and when the townspeople saw how few flowers there were in the wagon, they were dismayed, for there were barely enough flowers to put a small bouquet upon each grave, and those were mostly the wild flowers that Aster had picked along his way to town, but Everyone agreed that that was not nearly enough. All of those people believed that the souls of the dead could not possibly rest peacefully unless their graves were blanketed with flowers. The Lord Mayor said someone had to go to the king and ask the king to send more flowers so that everyone could be given a proper burial. And when the priest asked for a volunteer to travel to the capital city three days away, Aster soon saw that there was no one who was willing to make the long trip, so he made his way to the front of the crowd, and he told the priest that he would be willing to go and ask the king for help. But all the townspeople said no, he was just a boy. He would never be able to manage the long trip. But the priest looked down upon Aster, and he saw goodness and beauty and sincerity in the tear-stained face, and he said, this poor boy is our perfect emissary, He's so grief-stricken and so pitiable and so beautiful that surely no one would be able to refuse him anything he asked for. Well, Aster spent the rest of that night sleeping in the ruins of the fallen church, and early the next morning he was given a bag filled with bread and sausages, and he was also given a letter written by the priest and signed by the Lord Mayor to be given to the king, and Aster started off down the road toward the capital city. Well, Aster walked for two days, and at the end of that second day it was growing dark, and there were no houses in sight. Aster saw a little path that went up a hill into the woods, and he decided to follow it in search of a place to sleep, and he hadn't walked very far when he came upon a small clearing in the forest, and in the middle of that clearing there was some sort of an altar or a shrine. It was basically a, a table-sized rock with, with strange markings carved in its side, and it was situated underneath a roof that was supported by four columns, and the shrine seemed deserted. It seemed like no one had been there for a long time, and Aster thought that it must be a, an altar to some forgotten god, or perhaps some sort of a monument, or a gravestone, or, well, whatever it was. It was growing dark. Aster could go no further, so he sat down upon the rock. He ate some bread and a sausage, and he laid down upon the rock, and he closed his eyes, but Almost immediately, he heard a loud flapping sound, and when he opened his eyes, there was a big black bird standing by the rock. But this was no ordinary bird. It stood nearly as tall as a horse. Aster jumped down off of the rock, but then his fear turned to astonishment, for it seemed to him that the bird had spoken to him. 
Although the bird's beak was not moving, Astor seemed to hear his voice nonetheless, and somehow it seemed to him that the bird's voice was coming from somewhere inside of his own head. Why are you here? the bird seemed to ask. I'm very sorry, said Astra. I didn't know that this was your home. I, I've only just arrived. I've been walking all day. I just laid down to rest. Please don't eat me. I have some bread if you like. And Astor picked up his bag. He took out his last half loaf of bread. He laid it on the ground in front of the big bird. The, the bird picked up the half loaf of bread. He swallowed it all in one gulp. And then he said, but why have you walked all day long to come here? I've only stopped along my way to rest, said Astor. There was a terrible earthquake and our village was destroyed. All the houses fell down, the cathedral collapsed, and, and our barn collapsed too, and my horse was killed, and, and dozens of people were killed, and all their graves are in need of flowers, but my flower garden fell down into a great big huge crack in the earth, and the Lord Mayor and the priest have sent me to ask the king to send more flowers so that everyone can be given a proper funeral. It's just the worst thing that could ever happen. You think that's the worst that could ever happen, said the bird? Are graves without flowers the greatest tragedy you can imagine? Oh, this is hopeless, sobbed Aster. I can't even explain how terrible it is to a bird. How can I possibly hope to convince the king? Well, the bird nestled down upon the ground and he said, Lay hold of the feathers on the back of my neck with both hands and pull. Astor did as he was told. He reached up, he, he grabbed some feathers on the back of the bird's neck and just as he began to pull, he felt his feet lift up off the ground and the next thing he knew, he was lying on the back of the giant black bird, flying with him up into the sky. Astro was terrified. He shouted out, Stop! Let me down! Is flying so terrible? asked the bird. Is it worse than seeing broken houses and graves without flowers? No, nothing could be worse than that, said Astor, and the bird kept flying, and Astor looked down. He could see the black stone altar below him. He could see the roof that covered it over with. He, he saw the little path that went down the hill, down toward the road to the capital city, and still the bird flew higher. The bird flew so high that it soon began to grow cold, and Astor wriggled around on the great bird's back until he sank down beneath a blanket of feathers, and Although he felt warmer, the bird flew so high that it soon began to be difficult to breathe, and as his head sank down beneath the warmth of the feathers, Astor fell asleep as the bird flew higher still. Astor awoke with a start as the bird flapped his wings and came down upon the ground. It was, it was much warmer than it had been before, and there was a terrible stink in the air. Astor slid down off the bird's back. He stood on the ground. He looked around him. Off in the distance, he could see a, a fire burning atop a hill. And the bird said to him, You wanted to talk to a king? There, on the hill, near the fire, is a king. But you must return here before the sun rises above the horizon. Astor started walking across the field toward the hill with the fire, and he passed by a thorny bush covered with bright blue flowers unlike any he had ever seen before, and Astor had always collected unusual flowers, so he reached to pick one of the flowers. He, he scratched his hand on a thorn, but he picked the flower nonetheless, and he put it into his bag, and he continued along his way, and as he was wondering what could be causing the terrible stink, he, he tripped over something and he found himself lying face down upon the ground. And as he looked behind him to see what it was that he had tripped over, he could not help but scream with horror. For there, looking up at him from the ground, was a man whose face was twisted in an expression of pain and terror. Astor leapt to his feet, but there was no need to run. The, the man was most certainly dead. There was a large gash cut across his throat and the ground was stained with his blood. Astor stood there with his mouth wide open. He had, he had never seen anything quite so gruesome. He stood there wondering what to do. He, he had no shovel. He couldn't possibly bury the man. All he could do would be to put some flowers on the poor man's body and 
continue on to tell the king what he had found. Surely the king would send men to see to it that the man's body would be taken to his family so it could be laid to rest alongside of his ancestors. So Aster went back to the bush that had scratched him. He picked what flowers were left. He, he brought them back and he laid them on the poor man's body and he said a little prayer for the man's soul and he turned back toward the hill with the fire, but he hadn't walked very far when he came upon another dead man. And this man was dressed just like the first, and his throat had been cut as well. And Aster headed off toward another bush to pick more flowers, but before he even got there, he found a third dead man, and then a fourth, and, and this last man had a big knife or a sword sticking up out of his chest. Aster was dumbfounded. These men had not been killed by some terrible accident. They must have all been murdered by, by some madman who had gone insane. Master picked what flowers he could find. He, he laid a couple of lonely blossoms on each of the dead bodies, and then he headed back toward the hill with the fire, but he hadn't walked very far when he came upon a dead horse. And somehow the body of the dead horse was even more terrifying than the bodies of the dead men had been. For the horse had arrows sticking up out of its neck, and it was lying atop of another dead man whose throat had also been cut. Why would anyone kill a horse? And as Astor looked around him, he saw another dead horse and then another dead man. And as he walked toward the hill with a fire, he could scarcely walk more than a few steps without coming upon another dead man, all of them terribly cut and disfigured. Some of them had severed arms. After saw arms lying upon the ground, and one man was missing a head, which he soon saw lying not far from the rest of his body, and everywhere the ground was soaked with blood, and the stench was nearly unbearable, and as he approached the hill with the fire, he saw the fire was burning in front of a tent, and near the entrance to the tent there was a man sitting on a rock and at first Astor thought that this man must be dead too but when he got closer he heard the man snore and by that Astor knew that the man was only sleeping so he walked past the sleeping man he approached the tent he pulled back the flap over the door he looked in and there seated at a table was an old man with his head resting in his hands there were candles burning, and the table was covered with a large map, and on one corner of the table, atop the map, there was a golden crown set with jewels, and by that, Aster knew that the bird had spoken the truth, and that this man was indeed the king. So Aster approached the table, he cleared his throat, and he said, <clears throat> Your Majesty? The king seemed dazed or confused for a moment before he looked down upon the boy, and he said, what? What is it? Do you have news from the field? Your Majesty, there are dead horses and dead men lying all about. There must be dozens of them. Dozens? The last report said that there were hundreds. We killed 1,600 of theirs today, and they only killed 700 of ours. Where is your uniform, soldier? Who is your commanding officer? I'm not a soldier, Your Majesty. I'm only a boy. I've been walking for two days I've only just arrived why are all those men killing each other it's a war have you not heard of the war where you came from well you know your majesty my my grandmother once told me that her grandfather had once fought in a war but that was more than a hundred years ago and by the time it was over everyone had agreed that there had been so much death and destruction that it must never happen again what happened that caused you to go to war? It's my father's war. It's been going on since I was a baby. They took his castle and we're going to get it back again. At the cost of thousands of lives? What is so special about this castle? Couldn't you just build a better castle instead? Why do you need this castle? I don't need it. I have six castles. I have dozens of country estates. It's not the castle, boy. It's the land that went with it. There were farms and vineyards and mines. If we let them have that one, they'll take another and then another. But if they need more land, couldn't you offer to sell them some? There's no dealing with these savages. They don't understand the nature of civilized business dealings. The only language they understand is the language of a sword to the gut. 
But your majesty, surely you must know someone who speaks their language. I'm, I'm sure that if you were to sit down to table with their leader, you'd be able to come to some sort of an agreement. Surely it would be worth anything to, to stop all this killing and live in peace. There will be no peace until every one of them is dead. But your majesty, if you kill all the men, their sons and daughters will grow up hating you, and then there will be another war between your sons and theirs. It will never end. That's what my son said last week. Now he lies dead on the battlefield along with the rest. He was not much older than you are, and he was pretty and foolish like you. <sighs> the king sighed a heavy sigh, and for a moment Astor thought that he would cry, but then the king shouted out, Run away, boy! Run away back home where you came from! You don't belong here any more than my son did! You don't understand the value of valor or vengeance or victory! When we take the castle, we'll kill all of the children and all of their mothers so that when you grow up, you can live in peace! Upon hearing of the king's plan to kill the women and the children, Astor was terrified and confused, bewildered. He, he backed toward the door, he slipped outside, he, he walked past the still sleeping guard, and, and the, the sky was starting to lighten in the east, and in the dim light that came before the dawn, from the top of the hill, Astor could see much more of the death and destruction and devastation than he'd been able to see when it was dark. More dead soldiers, more dead horses, houses that had been burnt down to the ground. Astor ran down the hill. He ran all the way back across the battlefield to where he'd left the giant bird. And much to his relief, the bird was still there. The, the bird said nothing, and Astor said nothing. He, he reached up, he laid hold of the feathers on the back of the giant bird's neck, and once again the big bird lifted him up into the sky, and Astor buried his face beneath the feathers and he cried himself to sleep. When Astor awoke, he found himself lying upon the same black stone altar that he had lain upon the night before, and there was no giant bird there, nor was there any sign that he had ever been there. If it had all been a dream, it had been the strangest and most vivid dream he had ever dreamt. Most of his dreams were forgotten soon after waking, but this dream seemed to continue to torment him, the blood, the death, the horror, and as he walked back down the path towards the road to the capital city, he reached into his bag for his last piece of sausage, and he, he scratched his hand on something, and when he looked into the bag, he saw that there was a bright blue flower on a thorny stem, and Astor wrapped the flower in moss, he soaked the moss in water, and he headed down the road toward the capital city. Within a couple of hours, he started passing farmhouses and barns, and he made his way to the capital city. He found the castle, and much to his surprise, when he arrived there, he was directed to stand in a short line of merchants and nobles who had come to seek audience with the king, and Astor felt unafraid, for after all, he had already spoken with the king, and this king couldn't possibly be as bad as the first one he had met. And when his turn came to stand before the throne, it turned out that he didn't really have to talk much at all. He simply handed the king his letter, and the king read the letter, and he said, I have spent the better part of my day hearing the requests of, of greedy merchants and wealthy nobles. The others all want land and castles and titles and gold and... All this boy wants our flowers? <laughs> Give this pretty boy everything he wants. Send him home with, with two wagons filled with flowers and, and send a half a dozen wagons filled with lumber and, and a dozen carpenters to help rebuild his village and give him a horse to replace the one he lost. Well, Astor spent the rest of that day with the royal gardener who gave him a wealth of information and advice and two big jars filled with flower seeds along with his two wagons filled with flowers and the royal stabler helped him pick a yearling from the king's stables and on their way home, Astor stopped to put flowers on the altar where he had met the giant bird and although he found the path that went up the hill into the forest and he found the clearing in the woods. 
There was no altar there, nor was there any roof to cover it over with. But when Aster rode into his village on his new horse with his two wagons filled with flowers, he instantly became the town's latest and greatest hero, and five minutes later when the carpenters arrived with their wagons filled with tools and lumber, it seemed that the singing and rejoicing would never end. Well, by the next year, Astor's flower garden was bigger and more beautiful than it had been before the earthquake, and in the middle of the garden there was a thorny bush covered with bright blue flowers, unlike any anyone had ever seen before, and Astor's flower gardens were so big and so beautiful that all the women of the country would come to visit Astor and his gardens whenever they could, and when Astor grew old enough, he chose a clever and beautiful wife, and between them they raised a family of clever and beautiful children who never tired of hearing Astor tell the story of his journey to the distant battlefield, nor of his visits with the good king or with the bad king. And when Astor grew to be 30 years old, he and his son traveled to the capital city again. Men dressed in splendid uniforms had come to his village to recruit soldiers for the king's army, for it seems that a band of ruffians from a neighboring kingdom had crossed the border, and they'd spent the night drinking and carousing in a roadside tavern, and at the end of that night they'd torn the place up, and they'd taken two daughters of a wealthy nobleman home along with them, and because of the insistence of this wealthy nobleman, and along with the urging of the wealthy tavern owner, why, the king had been reluctantly raising an army to attack the neighboring kingdom, and when Astor heard about that, he and his 14-year-old son traveled to the capital city, and Astor spoke to the king again. And Astor reminded the king about their first visit, and since Astor's young son looked very much like Astor had looked the first time Astor had been there, the king actually remembered Astor, and... Astor told the king what had happened to him the night before their first meeting, the, the story he'd told his children so many times before, the, the story I've just told you, and upon hearing of all the death and the blood and the horror, why, the king's stomach turned sour, and instead of sending men with arrows and swords to the neighboring kingdom, instead he sent women with casserole dishes and, and musical instruments and the entire matter was settled simply and peacefully, and nobody had to kill anybody. And so Astor became a hero again. And although the shadow of darkness and sadness would stay with him throughout the rest of his life, Astor and his family lived happily ever after. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many other people living on many other planets, but we can never be welcomed into their communities until we as a people can learn to stop killing each other. Thou shalt not kill. War is not a necessary evil. We can get along quite nicely without it. Thank you all so very much for coming to Storytime. If you'd like to hear more stories, you could take them home with you on the seat.